get get going. Right. Okay. Uh, welcome back. Hope everybody's managed to make it back. Dr. Maureen Farrell is senior lecture, lecturer in the Glasgow University School of Education, responsible for culture, literacies, inclusion, and pedagogy. She started her working life as an English teacher in Ayrshire and Glasgow before working in teacher education at St Andrews College. And she went on to be the B.Ed. programme leader and the associate dean for initial teacher education and is now course leader for learning and teaching in the primary secondary school courses within the PGDE programme. From session 2019 to 20, she has taught the new international masters in children's literature, media and culture. Her PhD was entitled Culture and Identity in Scottish Children's Fiction, and she is co-editor of the forthcoming International Companion to Scottish Children's Literature. She's already given us a bit of a trailer for what I know from past experience will be a very enthusiastic and knowledgeable talk about the situation of Scots in schools education. Maureen Farrell. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, can I say I feel a bit of a fraud because some parts of this talk I have unashamedly picked the brains of Ren Ronnie Renton, uh, who has been part of the schools committee since the very beginning. Um, and I'm in deeply indebted to Ronnie for, for his um, information. Um, and the one thing I'm going to do now, because I am a teacher educator, is I, I am going to show a PowerPoint, but I promise you it's a very short one and it was just to help me to kind of remember things. So if it's OK with you, I'm going to share my screen just now. And can you just let me know, can you all see that? OK, that's brilliant. So let me just start by telling you a little bit about myself because um, my own background impacts on this. I went through my school education not particularly having done any Scottish literature, except maybe Burns. And I think that was the only thing that I did. I went to university in 1974 and uh, met a, a friend from another school who told me that he was doing Scottish literature in his first year. And I didn't know you could do that at that time. Um, I then spent 12 years working in secondary schools, then worked, began work in the teacher education um, college. And I decided at that particular point in time to um, deal with the gap in my own knowledge. So I went and did the MPhil in Scottish literature on a part-time basis at the University of Glasgow under Douglas Gifford's um, uh, maintenance. And I came out of that and one of the things that was so interesting about that particular um, um, film was that for each of the sections that you could do, you could do an assignment that was called classroom applications. And I came out of that programme, I had a standard grade unit on Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I had a higher unit on the poetry of Ian Crichton Smith. And I had a multi-level um, unit um, because Hire still had just come out at that point. I had a multi-level unit on Scottish fantasy. Um, so I, I made the actual um, programme work for me in terms of my um, teaching in school and school teaching. When I later on wanted to do um, a PhD, I wanted to do it in Scottish children's literature. And um, Rory gave us that fantastic list earlier on of all the areas that, that people, that there was lots of publishing and things going on. I was kind of disappointed that Scottish children's literature did not feature in that because it is a well, there's a wealth of material out there for children from the very youngest years up to young adult fiction. But when I applied to do my PhD, I'm told that there was a great deal of discussion at the Higher Degrees Committee because there was some concern that if, because I wanted to do something on Scottish children's literature, there was some concern that there wasn't enough out there for me to write about. And I think with my PhD, I think that was one of the things that showed them that there was ample material out there. So I am a passionate advocate for Scottish children's literature and how it impacts in schools, but not particularly here to talk about that as such. So let me go on to start to look at where Scottish um, language and literature um, 
fits in the school curriculum. Now, to be honest with you, I know that this predates the ASLS by some considerable time, but I do think it's quite important to look at how far we have actually come. Um, the attitudes, as this slide says, does um, they have changed and varied over the years. Um, and this is the comment that I often start when I'm doing a presentation about this to student teachers, because this was a, a comment in a 1946 HMIE report. It, Scots, is not the language of educated people anywhere and could not be described as a suitable medium of education and culture. Schools should wage a planned and unrelenting campaign to remove Scots language from schools. Now, okay, that was some time ago, and I am delighted to say that we have come some distance from that. And so I'm going to move kind of swiftly on to look at how, how some of the thinking has changed. I'm moving now to the 1990s, and in particular, a curriculum document that had a big impact on Scottish education, the 5 to 14 document. And in the language document, which was published in 91, the stance on Scottish language and literature had changed. Pupils should be allowed to use their mother tongue throughout the school. Given that language and identity are inextricably linked, it's often through literature in the Scots language that culture is transmitted. Scottish writing and writing about Scotland should permeate the curriculum. Now, I was teaching during that period of time and I'm sure that there are maybe one or two people on this particular um, Zoom meeting who were also teaching in schools at that time, and perhaps even one or two people who were at school uh, during that particular time. And what I find is when I talk to students who were in school at, during the 1990s and ask them if they remember if Scots language literature and culture permeated the curriculum, the resounding answer is no, they don't. And again, it comes down to that point that Derek was talking about earlier. And it was often, it was done by teachers who had a particular interest in Scottish language, literature and culture. The, currently, the thinking has moved on again. And currently what Curriculum for Excellence says is that Curriculum for Excellence provides a locus for valuing and building upon the languages that children bring to school. The language and literature of Scotland are valuable sources of learning about culture, identity and language. Now, it's a very positive message. It's quite non-specific, but it's a very positive message that's there. And what I think one of the things that interested me about what the way that that's phrased is that idea about the languages that children bring to school, because that echoes one of the most influential early reports that impacted on the classroom. And so what I'm going to do now is just have a quick look at, I, I found it hard to organise this talk into what was the best way to do it, but I thought I would look at some of the publications in particular and then look at the work of the ASLS Education Committee because that has a particular impact. The book that you'll see on the side is a report that was uh, published in 1976, and it was a report of the subcommittee on the study of Scottish literature in schools. And this subcommittee came out of, uh, there was a new committee formed in 1972 called the Scottish Central Committee on English. And they were the ones who set up this subcommittee. And they took this very seriously and had a very clear idea in mind about what this publication was supposed to do. And it talked about the fact that they wanted to investigate the place of Scottish literature in the English curriculum. They wanted to look at the corpus of works that were available for use. They wanted to think about the aims of what, what we wanted from Scottish literature. And then they wanted to look at methods of presentation for different stages. And when you look at this report, you'll see that they look at the early years in, from S1, S2, into the middle years of S3 and S4, and up into the upper uh, stages of the secondary school, S5 and 6. Um, and this report, in the words of my friend and colleague, Ronnie Renton, was a game changer. This was the thing that, that gave people the permission, if you like, to really 
building Scottish language and literature into the school curriculum. The, the primary schools were missing, but in 1980, there was a report published by um, the Scottish Committee on Language Arts uh, called Scottish English, the language children bring to school. And that was again, that was another game changer because up until that point in, in time, there had been this notion that if you spoke Scots, uh, it was somehow second class, you were told you weren't speaking properly. And there's this whole notion about what, is, what was correct language. Um, there's a lovely poem in one of the collections um, called, called The Kissed, it is called Listen to the Teacher. And it's actually a song, but it's, um, you know, and it's about the wee boy who goes to school from a farm community and gets laughed at because he says moose instead of mouse and hoose instead of house. And he comes back to the grandfather and the grandfather says, oh, you got to just, when you're in school, you say mouse. And when you're at home, you say moose. And there was this notion about, about being bilingual, that being, you were bilingual if you spoke Scots language. And that's not to say nothing of our third language, of course, which is Gaelic, and that's more of that later on. Interestingly, in that report of the Scottish literature in the secondary school, after they've done the, the main sections of looking at prose, poetry and drama, where they find in 1976 that there was a dearth of drama texts for schools, and there still remains a dearth of drama texts for schools to use. Um, there, there were two big essays, one about Scots language and one about Gaelic language, and they both feature in that um, particular document as well. Then there was a group of people working under, I think, under the leadership of Alan McGill McGillivray, um, who was then working at Jordan Hill, now Strathclyde University, of course, and was called the Project in Scottish Literature and Language. And that project ran for two years, and there was a great deal of material and publication that came out of that that was influential in Scottish schools uh, in the terms of resources, in terms of approaches, in terms of um, things like that. And much later on, um, in 1997, Alan uh, McGillivray um, produced a book called um, The Teaching of uh, Scottish Literature in Schools. And that was kind of one of the main um, books that was, was written with the intent of providing theoretical background for teachers, but also providing exemplar material for them to use. The Higher English has, is one of the oldest exams in the world, I think, in terms of its studies from the, from the 19th century, it started in its first version. Originally, the Higher English was actually Higher English and History, it was a joint exam. But the, the structure had kind of remained relatively stable until uh, in the, the re revision arrangements that happened in 1987 and then 1991. The first, the big revision arrangements for education in schools was the change from the old Scottish O grade to the standard grade English. And that was a huge change. It was a result of the Munn and Dunning report. And it was a, a whole, a huge change about how uh, people thought about um, the exam structure for the um, middle years of secondary school. And in the revised arrangements that were published in um, 1987, there was, a, I think it would be described as a paucity of advice on Scottish literature and language. One of the things it said was that it, we should make um, pupils aware of the main ways within which language works in their lives. Within this context, pupils should be made aware of the cultural diversity in Scotland and of the contribution of minority cultures. It then goes on to say, if Scottish pupils are to, be, are to achieve uh, the linked aim of linguistic development and personal enrichment described above, it is important that they should have some experience of Scottish literature. That's, that's kind of it. Um, and so what you get is basically a kind of an acknowledgement of Scottish literature rather than particularly promotion of it. When the revised higher arrangements came in, that was one of the places where there was determination to actually make Scottish literature central. 
And in, in the revised hire, there was the introduction of set texts. And among the set texts, these included Scottish texts. At that point in time, they had to do, they had to study one set text, but they didn't actually have to do a Scottish text, but they had to do that the, they could choose from a Scottish text. But the set texts were done like, if you like, context questions, you know, where there was a chunk of text and then there were questions and they had to write answers to it and so on. That was then later amended in 1997 um, when they decided to try to streamline the curriculum a bit. And there was a lot of talk about it being too full, too high, and all of these kinds of things. And um, it was so, um, one of the things they did was they took out the, the context question of set text and made them essay questions. And so there still were set texts, which included Scottish texts, but they weren't, they didn't um, necessarily examine them in quite the same way. And then in, uh, as you'll see, what happened then was the five to 14 document came in in 1991, the revised arrangements, there were further revised arrangements, as I said, in, of the higher. And then after those revised arrangements came out in 91, the, in 1994, they started work on a further revision of the exam system. And the higher still document called Opportunity for All was published in 1994, only three years after the last revision of the higher. And that substantially changed the structure of the Scottish higher, Scottish higher English in particular, went to a modularized form, and it went into areas where there was um, the, the there were different levels within the uh, the higher still uh, form, and there were different places where Scottish language, literature, and culture could be dealt with. And um, initially, the set texts were taken out, which seemed like a a, a, a really daft thing to do in in some in some ways. And um, when the when they it first came in, they first came into place in schools in 1999, the set texts were still there. Then later on in the 2000s, they were removed to much uh, great um, dis distraught reaction from many teachers, but not from others. And then in 2012, when they decided to put them back in, there was yet an another further, and I'm going to use the word stushy, because it's the only word I can think of to use, because there were lots of people who said that putting the set text back in narrowed the curriculum. And in fact, it was, it was, it was a hugely uh, problematic issue for schools. And um, I don't know whether this is the point in time where I should say to you that I did consider subtitling this talk there and back again in the best interests of talking because it for, for a lot of the times in Scottish school education, the Scottish language and literature um, field has felt a bit like taking two steps forward and one step back. Um, but anyway, the curriculum for excellence then comes in in 2010. And at that particular point in time, it was being rolled out from the first years, you know, from five to 14 broadly. And then the guidance about the, high, the higher educate, the, the exam systems and the move to standard grade five and six um, happened, the publication of that advice came out in 2014. And it was at that point in time that there was a kind of um, move to look at the place of Scottish literature and language in schools in the secondary school and also to look at um, uh, award making recognition for that. So there was the Scottish Studies Award was put in um, so that that was um, something that schools could opt into um, in their, at various stages in the secondary school. Now, I realize I'm doing this at kind of um, whistle stop pace, but that's because of the, the time allowance. I did want to talk a bit about the ASLS Schools and Further Education Committee, because we're talking about what we've done and what we've achieved in, in our 50 years. The ASLS Schools and Further Education Committee first met in around 1976. Ronnie says that Rod Lyle grabbed him and said, you'll need to be part of this. And I think that was, was perhaps, it was uh, from a few interested people um, that 
particularly and people who came from the Jordan Hill project and various people who started to come together to look particularly at Scottish language and literature in schools. And one of the things they began to do was to begin to produce Scottish language and literature resources for schools. And that's the thing that I think is one of the, the, the biggest achievements of the, this particular committee. We actually launched our um, schools conference, the Scottish uh, ASLS schools conference in 1983. And so this year's conference, which takes place on the 4th of October, will be our 38th conference. And it will be our second um, online conference. Uh, we, we had to move it online. We had a lot of debate about whether we would go back to face-to-face -face or not, but uh, we've decided to, to um, keep it as online conference. And actually the attendance uh, for that has been really excellent. Um, the launch of Scott Notes in 1986, and the, the first two were um, Grasset Gibbon's Sunset Song and the poetry of Edwin Morgan. And I'm delighted to tell you that we are up to, I think our number is now 42 different Scott Notes. And with more planned with us, I think we've got titles up to our 50th publication in, in the works. So that's a huge um, area of development. And these books are used widely in schools. They are used by school teachers. They are used by school pupils. And I think for some, to some degree, that's actually their, um, their, their selling point, if you like, in that you can use them as a teacher working with classes, but equally you can, if you're a fifth or sixth year pupil, you can use these to help you read and study for yourself. Along with um, the, this, we produce a range of support materials for schools. We've got a series of what are called teaching notes on lots of different topics, which can be freely downloaded from the ASLS um, website. And um, I'm going to look at a couple of other bigger publications in just a second. The, this particular committee um, has worked with and consulted with um, the SQA and previously the Scottish Exam Board before the SQA. Uh, it's worked with the Scottish Government, it's worked with the Scots Language Resource Network, and we have contributed to every request for information about Scottish language and literature in schools and how it should be um, how it should be uh, responded to. And um, partly as a result of the success of the ASLS Schools Conference and the fact that not everybody can get to that conference. Um, the, the conference has been filmed since 2013 and these have now been, there's now a separate um, YouTube channel where all of these talks can be viewed um, and, and cumulatively. So there's a huge resource there. And this is just some of the other publications that have come as a result of the ASLS Schools Committee. Um, we've got there some of the some of the other ones. Look, I just thought I'd put up a couple of different covers for the Scott Notes just to show you they don't always look the same. So we've got the Prime of Miss Jean Brody and uh, one on, on uh, Robert Burns. Um, in 2003, we produced this book, and this is partly um, one of the things that the ASLS Education Committee has been aware of is that there has tended to be a very strong focus on secondary school education. Um, this publication in 2003 was called Treasure Islands, and it was actually aimed at the, the curriculum policy that predated 5 to 14, which was 10 to 14. And in this book, we looked at lots of Scottish children's books aimed at the 10 to 14 age group. And in it, there was a short synopsis of the book. There was a suggested age range, target age range. It was gr grouped under thematic headings. So you could get adventure stories, you get Scottish fantasy stories, you could get folklore and fairy tales. You could get um, uh, contemporary real life stories, all kinds of things there. And that was published in 2003. And 
the we then went on under the guidance i have to say of the late lamented jim allison he continued to post additional material for um, treasure islands online through the asls website uh, we've got when, when, when I mentioned the, the problem with the death of Scottish Place. Now, this play, this book, Scottish Place for School, was published. Unfortunately, it's currently out of print. And it's one of the ones that, that has uh, proved really, really positive uh, for use in schools. We have looked at um, collaborations with other people, uh, particularly uh, John Corbett and Christian Kay um, from the Christian Kay from the English Language Department, um, looking at understanding grammar in Scotland. Actually, looking at what are the rules for grammar and, and how does our language change. Um, and then we look at working with organisations such as the wonderful uh, multimedia organisation Metafrog, who produced a wonderful version of um, a comic version of um, the first Ma Men on Mercury, uh, the Edwin Morgan's poem. And uh, there's a lot of, on the, the Metafrog site itself, there's a lot of teaching materials for that um, that goes with it. And I've put up our kind of latest publication, uh, which is again um, aimed at the lower stages of um, the secondary school, or what is now called the Broad General Education, the BGE, so years one to three, but actually lots of the poems in it are available, could be used in the primary school also. Now, the thing about this is that we've, again, we've, we've since the, the the layout of the Treasure Islands book worked really well. There's been something similar done with the presentation of the Voices for Scotland in that there's um, the poem is given in its entirety, so you don't have to go looking about for um, a copy of the poem. Uh, there's a, so a commentary on the poem and there's some suggested work um, that teachers can use as a start to this and the other thing that we went to some considerable effort to do was to try to make these copyright free so that people would not feel worried about photocopying or make, having access to uh, the resources and that was actually published in 1997 in God, 1997 drink up morning 2019 so it's a very recent publication um and then I also wanted just to finish before I kind of, as I say, it's a whistle stop tour. But I wanted to look at um, the range of other support materials that has come about partly because of people interested in this, in working with Scottish language literature in schools, and partly because of enthusiasts, enthusiastic teachers, enthusiastic children and young people, um, enthusiastic lecturers at university and so on. And I don't propose to look at all of these, but I just want to look very quickly at a couple of um, things, if I can make sure that I can access this. Um, now, this one is, this is from the Scottish Book Trust. And I want to, uh, uh, now, can you see that? Uh, I'm not sure if you can. Let me stop my share for a moment and I'll I'll share my screen again and I'll show you it from my own laptop. Five minute warning, Maureen. Right, that's fine. Um, so if we look at that, the Scottish Book Trust, and I'm, I'm stopping after this. Right, can you now see that? Yes, I hope so. So there's you have, this is just one of their book lists and you'll see that there's, a whole load of books, children's literature, young adult literature. And what I like about it is it's Scottish books, but in fact, it's set, no, it doesn't have to be set in Scotland, doesn't have to be um, something that's specifically for that kind of thing. There's a whole load of range of different things um, from that point of view. And similarly, if we look at um, this one, and this is my I promise you, this is my last one. Oh, it keeps taking me to the same, sorry, it keeps taking me to the same, um, look, if I do this, try it again. It's not taking me to the right place. I'm not going to fight with it, but basically um, there is, if you look at the Scots language website, there is, um, I'm going to stop my share again at the moment. 
uh, there is a, a huge wealth of resources from um, the Scots language area, there's teachers resources, there's a link to the Wee Windy site, which is at the um, National Library of Scotland. Uh, there's songs, there's poems, there's multimedia things. In other words, there's a wealth of material there that wasn't there before. And I have to say, I think that that is largely down to the work of the Education Committee um, of the ASLS. And I'm going to stop there because I know that we've got time limitations. I'm sorry about the whistle stop nature. I'm sorry about the slight glitch, glitch in technology at the end. But I do, um, I'm happy to make this slideshow available for anyone who wants to look at it and for you to follow up on these afterwards. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Maureen. I knew it was going to be enthusiastic and knowledgeable, as I said, and it certainly fulfilled that. Um, we just have a couple of minutes, I think, uh, for questions. If anybody, I'm just having a quick check at the second screen. I've got a clapping hand, but I haven't got. Uh, <laughs> haven't got right. So I'll I'll do the chairman's um, the chairman's role as usual. Um, I mean, obviously, as a member of the Education Committee myself, I'm, I'm aware of the, the resources that are there. Um, but it does depend on teachers being willing and wanting to use them. Uh, and Scotland is about the only country in the world which doesn't actually make the teaching of its own literature, you know, a natural thing. Uh, mm -hmm. It's something we have to fight for, and the SLS has fought for that, you know, to get the compulsory Scottish question and so on. Um, so to go back to what Derek asked earlier, um, you know, is there still a need for more legislation in Scottish schools, in Scottish teacher education? Well, um, it's really interesting you mentioned that. There was a report that was published in 2011, and one of the recommendations that came from that was that um, Scottish if you wanted to be a, an English teacher in Scotland, that there should be a rule that you had to have studied at least one course in Scottish language and literature. And as you can imagine, the members of the Education Committee all applauded that enthusiastically and thought that was a fantastic thing to do. But the problem is that you cannot legislate for that in, in the sense that we take in our course in the University of Glasgow, and I know in other universities they do as well, they take students to become, to train to become teachers in Scotland from Firth of Scotland. So we have people mm -hmm. who come from Northern Ireland, who come from England, who come from Canada and, you know, various places. And you cannot, you couldn't say to them, well, you can't come and train to be an English teacher unless you've got a course in Scottish language and literature, because that wouldn't necessarily be possible. Um, and also the thing is that that it would be quite restricting. I I personally have no problem with that. I think it'd be brilliant if you could do that. Um, but I don't know that that could be, I don't know if it would be practical in, in, in reality. I and there is, a, the, a, a, in terms of legislation, you must do Scottish literature. You're absolutely right. We're the only, one of the only countries that don't say you must teach Scottish stuff. And I think that is a difficulty. And um, I think the, the, the exam pe board people and the Scottish government think they've done sufficient to promote it positively and to, to make places for it in, in the assessment cycle of things like that. But oftentimes it is down to the enthusiast, the person with particular interest. And there is still also among the general public, I would say, particularly in terms of Scots language, there is a prejudice about using Scots language and asking children to write in Scots and, and uh, read Scots language, because among parents and grandparents, there is this idea about it's not proper, it's not correct English. And no matter how much you talk to them, and, and, and a lot of my uh, students will say, but Scots is slang. And it's the one thing that's guaranteed to light my blue touch paper and retire because I go absolutely bonkers with them about that, you know? So I, I, I know what you mean, but I'm not sure how practical it is. Okay, um, I maybe should have waited a, a little while before leaping in because I see that John Corbett's got his hand up um, and uh, we're slightly going over time, but I don't want to cut you off, John. Do come in. Okay, th thanks. Uh, thank you and greeting, greetings here from China. Um, uh, 
that was great, Maureen, and I enjoyed that very much. It took me back. <laughs> and I just wanted to pick up on a couple of things that you said, which also falls from what Morna and Derek were saying. Uh, I worked very briefly with others on the Higher Still Scots Language uh, exam, writing it. And at the time when I was in, talking to teachers and when I was talking to other people, it wasn't the lack of legislation and it wasn't necessarily the lack of an exam because the exam had been instituted to try to encourage Scots language. And it wasn't even necessarily the lack of resources, although resources were lacking. It was a lack of confidence and I don't think it was necessarily prejudice. Mm. But because it was a new exam, people were saying, this is high stakes. This yeah. is your future. Stick to what you know. know. We know what is involved in exam X. We have no idea what to do with exam Y. We don't know uh, strategic, strategically, if we want to come back to Rory's word, we don't strategically know what to do to advise you to go and sit this exam. So there were problems, I think, systemically and culturally in building up a degree of familiarity and confidence. And I think that takes a systemic consensus working in the same direction so that the legislation is there, the resources are there, the exam is there, and time is taken to bed it in so people are familiar and confident with it. One of the nice things for me about the ASLS is it was one of the few places in Scotland where different people from different walks of life, universities, schools, uh, legislators could come together and have these conversations, but there weren't enough of them. No. And um, thanks very much, John. And I, and I see that Heather's put that nice comment in the chat about teacher who frequently reads and writes and speaks in Scots um, with all pupils primary school. And has been said, I found that many native Scots speaking teachers struggle to read written Scots. I've lost count of the number who've told me they can't read it. And I'm finding a lot of negativity among colleagues and parents and carers regarding the issue that Maureen was discussing at the moment. So thank you, Heather, for that um, confirmation of what I'm saying. So I'm aware that time is moving on, so I'm going to stop there. So, Well, thank you very much again, Maureen. Uh, extremely informative. And I think this is the sort of thing that would we'll, probably lead to you know, more discussion at coffee breaks and at lunch breaks if we were in a, in a real life situation. However, given that we are not, people can make use of the chat facility uh, to carry on the conversation to some extent. Um, but at the moment, uh, thank you again, and we shall move on to the next stage 